This episode contains adult language and topics that may be disturbing for some listeners. Such topics include suicide, drug use, physical or sexual abuse of a child. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Grant. And I'm Erica. And this is From From Crime Crime to to Crime. Crime. Welcome back to From Crime to Crime. Hey, Grant. How's it going? <laughs> Good, Erica. How are you? <laughs> are we in su- super formal for this one? Yeah, no, but we are going to get right into this one because this story is bananas. Well, Mrs. Mead, why don't you take us away and let us hear it? I even bought a book. What? Like an actual book because they didn't have an audio book. Oh, you should have tried renting it from your library first. Being fiscally responsible is the, the way to go. Yeah, well... What's what is the book called? It's called A Beautiful Child by Matt Birkbeck. And he has written two books on this story because it is so bananas that it took decades to like unravel all the threads. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I don't know anything about this story. Erica has done all of the research per usual, I know, but she's done everything and even excluded me from knowing what this case is even about. So I don't know anything. I don't know the case i don't know names i don't know what's going on but i have been told to buckle up yep and i hope you took like your ginkgo biloba or whatever your brain medicine is because (laughs) i don't even know what we're gonna ginseng oh ginseng okay because i don't even know what we're gonna call this episode yet or where to start so try to keep up okay oh and for the record i take fish oil for my cognitive abilities okay Make sure, though, Grant, seriously, if you're kind of like lost or confused, that you ask like right away so I can clear it up for you before we get too far, because it's going to be really hard to like go back and explain something if you just do your Grant thing where you're like, oh, I must have missed something. Yep. All right. Well, let's go. I'm ready. I've buckled up. All right. So we're going to like sort of Quentin Tarantino this story a bit. We got to start like in the middle and then go forward and then go back. It's a hot mess. But. We're going to start at a strip club called the Mons Venus in Tampa, Florida in 1989. The what? The Mons Venus? Yeah, which is like derived from a Latin term for female genitalia. So that's pretty straight up in your face. (laughs) Kind of what I was thinking, actually. So I'm glad I asked. Yeah. So you know this story is already going well. Florida, 89. (laughs) You know what that means. Anything involving Florida I know is going to be a disaster. Well, in 1989, you know what that means. Cocaña. No. <laughs> no? Oh, I was, I was definitely thinking it was cocaine. What? Lawless Florida land. 1980... Oh, yeah. Well, it's true. It was a lawless land. But that's why co- cocaine was so prevalent, because it was a lawless land. Yep. So we're starting with a girl named Cheryl Camesso. And she was 19. She was working as an exotic dancer at this Mons Venus strip club. And she's making really good money. She's apparently really good at what she does because she even bought a Corvette that she loves. She got breast implants. She was like killing it. I hear that that is a place where you can make a lot of money very quickly. Yeah. So she's friends with a fellow dancer named Sharon Marshall, who's like 18 or 19. And she has an infant son named Michael. And we have to give you a little bit of background on Sharon since she's a pretty major player in this story. So she lives with her dad, Warren Marshall. It was kind of a weird turn of events that landed her working as a dancer at this club in the first place. Sharon was super, super smart. She grew up in Georgia in a suburb outside of Atlanta, and she had an IQ of like 134 or something in high school. Oh, damn. Yeah, super smart. And she was really involved in like after school curriculum stuff like ROTC, and she was had big dreams of working for NASA someday after going to college for aerospace engineering. So this isn't an evil genius, it sounds like we normally talk about when we talk about geniuses on this podcast. Yeah. This girl was a, a good genius. Yes, she was very smart. And her father, Warren, was super strict and a single parent. It was just Warren and Sharon. Her mother had passed away in a car accident when she was really young. So Warren worked as a painter, and they struggled a little bit financially, but in school, she thrived. Good for her. Yeah. 
There were some red flags, though, about Warren and his relationship with his daughter that people noticed over the years. But most people who saw these red flags just kind of brushed it off because Sharon was such a good student. They thought, well, he must be doing the best he can as a single dad. Like, we must be overthinking this or something. What were the red flags? Just he was very overprotective, overly strict. She had to be home by 430 every day to make him dinner. Oh, that's bizarre. Yeah. Like she really took care of him more than he took Hmm. care of her. Like it was very a very dependent relationship. So by her senior year of high school, she got a full ride scholarship to Georgia Tech. That's great school. Very impressive. And she was over the moon, so excited, but she wasn't sure her dad was even going to let her go to college because of the whole, like, she had to cook for him and clean for him and do all the household stuff. She wasn't sure he was even going to let her go away to school. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's weird. Mm Mm-hmm. But after she told him about the scholarship, he finally decided to let her go. But by the end of her senior year in 1986... Sharon actually ended up getting pregnant when Warren found out he was less than supportive about it. She ended up either losing her scholarship because of it or he made her give up her scholarship and not go to college. How does he have that kind of say? Because at this point, she's got I mean, she's got to be what? 22? She's 17. She's a senior in high school. Oh, sorry. I thought you said she was a senior in college. No, she's a senior in high school. Oh, I thought we fast forward. Okay, so she's a senior in high school. She's 17. She gets pregnant. Okay, Mm -hmm. I got it. Sorry. I thought we skipped to college. No, no, no. So he makes her give up the scholarship, right? Gosh. And she was devastated. Sure. Like, this was her life. What about the baby? Did he make her do anything with that? Yes. So her and her high school boyfriend end up running away together to Alabama, but Warren tracked them down and he told the boyfriend that he wasn't the father and he took Sharon home. And once she was home and she gave birth to this baby, it was given up for adoption right away. So it's not super clear if this was her choice or Warren's choice, but either way, she gave the baby up. Um, How did he know he wasn't the father or was he just making that up? No. Afraid he was just making that up to get the boyfriend to oh, be okay. mad and leave. Yeah, no, he was making it up. I was afraid he was the father of her baby. No, no, no. Weird. Yeah. You're getting crazy already. It's not that crazy. Well, you told me this was a <laughs> wild ride with twists and turns. I'm thinking real outside the box. All right. Well, we'll get there. And Alabama's involved, so you know, yeah. never mind. <laughs> So what was clear, though, that was Warren's choice was them relocating to Phoenix immediately after she had this baby. So she did graduate from high school and everything and then had the baby but didn't go to college. And he relocated the family to Phoenix. Drastic move. Yes. Once they were in Phoenix, she tried to run away again in Phoenix and he tracked her down again and brought her back. And it was like this big thing. Yeah, this is all awful already yeah so when they were living in phoenix this is when warren decided he was going to retire and stop working as a painter because he supposedly had some major back problems and couldn't work and sharon started working as an exotic dancer to pay their bills wow that's a big left turn Mm -hmm. soon after she started working as a dancer in phoenix she got pregnant again and warren immediately moved them to tampa florida jeez Yeah, and it's been said that it was so abrupt that she didn't even get to tell the father of the baby that she was pregnant, that he just literally packed her up and they moved to Florida. How fast was that? I mean, it's almost like he had this like ready to go because I think it'd be a fairly easy thing to, hey, we're leaving. Okay, I'm going to go tell the father. No, you're not. And like pack up and go like that. Yeah. So quick. Well, you're starting to see like the control he has over her, obviously. Yeah, certainly. So once they get to Florida, little baby Michael was born in March of 1988. For some reason that we don't really know for sure, Warren let Sharon keep this baby. He didn't make her give it up. Strange behavior already, but okay. Yeah. I kind of get the impression that he might have let her keep it because he figured out that they could make more money on welfare benefits and food stamps and stuff like that if she had a baby. Oh, my God. How about letting her go to school to become whatever great thing she was going to be? You're probably going to make a lot more money off of that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, this would be a very different story if that had happened. Yeah. Well, we probably wouldn't be talking about it, I guess. Yep. So by early 1989, Sharon's working at the Mons Venus Strip Club where she met and became friends with... Cheryl Camesso, the girl that we were talking about in the beginning, the 19-year-old with the Corvette. Right. 
so the relationship between Sharon and her dad, Warren, though, is really awkward, to say the least. He was a fucking loser, pretty much, obviously, like we've decided. He relied on welfare and Sharon's money to get by. He was like a total douche. Yeah, total deadbeat. Yeah, and he was really controlling and strict and all up in her business. He makes her work seven nights a week, and he's way too involved in her work considering what she's doing for a living. Like, she's an exotic How dancer. In- Right. So how involved is he? Well, it's so bad at some point that the club owner at the Mons Venus had to ban him from coming inside the club because he would come in and watch her perform. (laughs) And everybody around was uncomfortable, I imagine. So it's like, nah, man, you can't come back because you're weird. Yeah. Like, who does that? It's your daughter. Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm uncomfortable. And this was happened before I was born. Right. So, no, we're in 1988 by now. 89. Oh, gosh, this is moving quick. I thought we were still in 86. No. She graduated high school in 86, and then they moved to Phoenix. She had got pregnant again, and then they moved to Florida, and then she had the baby in 88, and now we're in 89. Okay. Okay? All right. Yep. So... Cheryl and Sharon become pretty good friends at some point, and there's been rumors that Cheryl and Warren, Sharon's dad, had like a brief romantic relationship because supposedly he knew people in the adult film industry in California, and she wanted to get into that. Like, she wanted to get into movies and porn and stuff Mm -hmm. so he kind of acted like he could get her an in on that but if their brief relationship was true at all it ended abruptly one night they were supposedly on a boat and he made some sort of advance towards her and she rejected him so instead of being like oh that sucks and it being like real awkward for a little bit on the boat ride back to the dock (laughs) yeah that would be pretty awkward for a little bit yeah, Warren just decided that he was just going to punch her in the face. <laughs> ah, solid adult uh, choice. All right. Yep. So apparently at this point she jumped overboard to get away from him and like swam back to shore. Yee. Which is real sketchy in Florida because wherever there's water, there's alligators. So obviously it was bad whatever happened if she jumped and overboard. snakes. Yeah. Florida's essentially just like a little Australia. There's yeah. all kinds of weird stuff everywhere. So yeah. Yeah. I'm not on, on that vibe. Right. So Cheryl's pissed at this point, obviously. But instead of going to the cops and reporting him for assaulting her, she decided that she was going to call the state welfare office and make a report that Sharon was making like $1,500 a week as a dancer under the table and not claiming it. Oh, wow. She really went for the jugular Mm -hmm. where it would really hurt. Yep. You know, because we know kind of these situations, you know. He he said, she said kind of stuff. Cops don't always do something. But right. in this regard, the welfare office, I think, is going to listen. Yep. So they send a letter to Sharon and Warren's house saying that their benefits are being suspended while they investigate the claim. And this did not go over well with Warren. So he started showing up at the strip club and confronting Cheryl. They fought pretty frequently about it. Like, it was bad. The bouncers always intervened and, you know. I was going to say, where were the bouncers on this? Like, oh, yeah. as soon as this guy showed up, I'd be like, turn your ass around. Get yeah. out of here. You're not welcomed. They And that's what would happen. They would have to, like, you know, walk her to her car at night and stuff because he would confront her in the parking lot. It was really bad. So a couple weeks later, Cheryl packed her bags to go on a trip to visit some friends. She might have been thinking, like, oh, maybe this drama will die down while I'm gone. Or maybe she was planning on moving on to another strip club because she had worked at a few clubs between, like, Miami and Tampa. So it was just kind of like, uh, this is really contentious. I'm going to get away for a little bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. To say the least, I'd say this is, is getting contentious. Yeah. So either way, whether it was just to visit a friend for a couple of weeks or to get away from this drama, it seemed to have worked. Because after she left on this trip, Warren decided that him and Sharon and little baby Michael were moving again. And they packed up and hit the road and headed to New Orleans. Back in Tampa, though, Cheryl never returned from this trip. And after about a month, her Corvette was reported abandoned at the airport and she was reported missing. Oh, shit. But nobody knew what happened to her. Like, she just kind of vanished. And this is a lawless, lawless land. So, I mean, there's not a whole lot of ways to track her at this point. Yeah. Some people just thought she had moved on to another club. You know, obviously her family was like really upset about it and reported her missing. But there wasn't much the police could do. They were like, well, she's an adult. 
she'll show up somewhere. It's crazy that people just go missing sometimes like in these stories. And it's just like, well, that's all we could do and <laughs> move on to the next. Yep. So by June of 89, Warren and Sharon are now in New Orleans. We don't really know why, but they're now going by Clarence Hughes and Tanya Tadlock. Like they just changed their names. And they're not even father and daughter anymore? No. They changed their names to Clarence Hughes and Tanya Tadlock. And shortly after they got their new IDs, they got married. What? Yes. To each other. His daughter? Yes. And him? Yes. I'm following this right. Yes. Correct? This is daughter. Oh my yeah. God. Okay. So instead right. of father and daughter and grandson, they're now living as husband and wife and we're telling people that Michael was their son together. Uh, okay. Um. Why? Well, we don't know yet, but we'll get there. Okay. So they're living under these new names, and there's rumors that Tanya, a.k.a. Sharon, was pregnant again by the time they went to New Orleans. And when she had this baby, it was adopted privately by a couple who paid Clarence, a.k.a. Warren, $10,000 for it. Do we know, is this his baby again? Or not no. again, but is this... His? Okay, it's still not. So it's still not. They're married, but they're still not, as far as we know, doing anything Correct. real weird. Mm-hmm. So at this point, Clarence, Tanya, and Michael move again, and this time to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she got a job at another gentleman's club as a dancer, and Clarence made her work all the time. How old is she at this point? She's like 19, 20. Okay. So she's working all the time, seven days a week, no days off, no breaks. The only time she didn't work was when the club was closed. Like, so Christmas and Thanksgiving. <laughs> I, I, I would think they're probably still open those times. Huh? Yeah. You know, people, people without families are probably like, eh, I'll go watch this. So Yeah. So by all accounts, he was extremely abusive. Like, she would show up to work every day with fresh bruises, and she Good had made Lord. some new friends at the club that she's kind of opened up to a little bit, and they would try to convince her to leave him. You know, thinking it's her husband. You know, you got to leave it. That's what I was going to say. These people still think it's her husband and not her dad at this point. Correct. Yes. So they're trying to get Tanya to leave Clarence and, you know, get away. And she tells them, like, I can't. I've tried to leave him in the past. He always finds me. And if I ever do it again, he's going to kill me. Like, the next time I leave, he's going to kill me. Oh, my God. She was in an extreme situation. They had put together that apparently he had some rule that she had to make $200 a day or he would beat her. Oh, my God. That's probably pretty easy to do on, like, a Friday, Saturday night situation. But, like, on a Tuesday, probably might come up a little short. I'm not sure that... I could see that happening. Like, a Tuesday at a strip club in Tulsa, Oklahoma is going to be a real (laughs) moneymaker. Yeah. So on the days that she would come up short, the other girls would try to like scrape together the difference so that she wouldn't get beaten by her husband. Oh, my God. That's how bad they knew it was. So by 1990, Tanya had started like a super top secret relationship with a man named Kevin, who was her own age. Good. You know, because Clarence is twice her age and abusive and shitty and might be her dad and this whole weird thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot going on. Yeah. So she starts a super secret relationship with a man named Kevin that she met at work. That kind of gave her the courage to finally start taking the steps to make plans to leave Clarence, like to take Michael and to leave. Do we know what Kevin was? Was he a DJ? Was he a bouncer? Was he a frequent visitor? What was he? Um, I've read in a couple of places. None of the articles are super verifiable about this story. That's why a lot of people use the book by Matt Birkbeck as the Bible on this because he's an investigative reporter and he did so much research. But the couple things that I've heard was that he was a regular cl- like client at the club. And then a couple things that I've heard was that he was at the club once for like a bachelor party or like a birthday for a friend or something. And that's where they met. But he didn't work at the club. He was a patron. That's how he met her. I've actually known a couple of guys who have gone to strip clubs and were convinced the strippers were like in love with them. Yeah. And I'm not kidding. I knew one guy who spent his entire paycheck in one night because he was convinced this girl loved him yeah. and like went back and like was withdrawing money and all this kind of stuff. And I don't remember how it ended, but I know he was heartbroken at the end yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> 
which is usually how that goes. Yeah. But this relationship seemed to be a little more, uh, um, I don't know the word, real. <laughs> like, she really was into him, and he was into her, and he was giving her the courage to leave Clarence, finally. So, on April 25th, 1990, Tanya had finally taken a night off work, the first time ever. And it was assumed that she was going to use this night to finally get away from Clarence. But? <laughs> yeah. But, instead, around 1 a.m. on a highway outside of Oklahoma City, near a Motel 6, Tanya was found on the side of the road. And she was alive, but she was in bad oh. shape. She be Has she been beaten? Well, she was convulsing, and she had a massive head injury to the back of her head. Oh, man. There was scattered groceries and a Walkman with headphones lying all around her. So it was assumed that she was hit by a car walking from the convenience store back to the motel, and the car took off and didn't stop. Mm. Oh, my God. Yeah, so she was rushed to the hospital. The doctors noted all of her injuries, new and old. And so they immediately were like, I wonder if this woman was a victim of domestic violence. Like, she's got yeah. tons of injuries, you know. I kind of think she was hit by a car, too, but by someone she knew. Yeah. So she didn't ever really regain consciousness. The only thing she murmured that the doctors and nurses have reported was she said the word daddy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. I was taking a drink of water right when you said that. And I was like, oh, God. Yeah. So <sighs> Clarence didn't show up at the hospital until the next day. He told them that he had fallen asleep at the motel and she must have gone out for snacks after he fell asleep. And he didn't even know she was gone until he woke up the next morning. And then he didn't even know about the accident until the motel manager told him. Then that's when he was like, oh, man, that might be Tanya. So he says they were together at the motel in Oklahoma City for a doctor's appointment for Tanya. For like probably another pregnancy? no. From what I gather, this story seems like maybe Tanya was at the motel alone, like she was trying to get away from him, and then he tracked her down. That makes, yeah. But but he told the investigators that they were at the motel together for a doctor's appointment, but the investigators were never able to verify a doctor's appointment anywhere. Like, there was no Tanya Hughes that had a doctor's appointment anywhere in Oklahoma City. Right. He was really an asshole, and everybody was getting, like, real bad vibes, but they don't know. You know, they're just like, oh, okay, this guy's a jerk. And they could tell that she was obviously a battered woman. Like, she was obviously a Be victim yeah. of domestic violence. And Yeah, I imagine at this point she's got bruises up and down her body. And if he's leaving where people can see, yeah. he's also probably leaving worse ones where people can't see, and now the doctors are seeing them. Right. But... She's also not in there for being beaten. You know, she was hit by a car. Yeah. So right. they tell the police their suspicions, but, you know, she's in there for a totally different reason. So while she's in the hospital, you know, in this pretty much comatose state, they noticed his behavior was really awkward. Like he was supposedly completely unbothered by his wife's condition, just like whatever. Like he didn't give a shit. And the only thing he managed to do while he was there was he made a homemade sign for her door that said no visitors before he left. Oh, my God. Yeah. And the staff was obviously like super upset. They're like, this woman's in a coma. Yeah. First of all, aren't you going to sit with her? And if you're not going to sit with her, why are you not letting anybody else sit with her? Like, you're kind of a dick. To say the least. Yeah. And that's all they know. Obviously, he's a monster, but right. that's all they know is that he's just kind of a dick. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, her friends at the club find out about the accident and her secret boyfriend finds out about the accident and they come to see Tanya in the hospital. They just rip the stupid sign up. They're like, fuck that. We're visiting our friend. Like, that's not real. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And the nurses are like, no, it's not real. Like, <laughs> you <can laughs> certainly go in there. So <laughs> good. They're visiting her at the hospital over the next couple of days. And she seems to be actually making like improvements, some function like she didn't wake up, but she had some signs like, you know, turning her head or squeezing somebody's hand or what. Like there were signs that she was making improvements. She was happy that people that actually cared about her <laughs> were there to see her instead of her. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, her father, husband, who's forced her into this, this terrible life where I mean, she could have been an astronaut. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 
So the doctors and the nurses and her friends and everybody are telling the police, like, Clarence had to have something to do with this, especially her friends. Like, they were telling the cops, like, we know it was him. He hit her. He had to have. She was going to leave him. You know, they tell him the whole thing, but there's not really much they can do. They're like, well, there's no proof. He doesn't have a car that matches anything. You know, like, there's no damage to his car or whatever. Right. So Tanya, like I said, seems to be making progress and looks like she's going to pull through this. And then five days after the accident, Clarence... Clarence came to see Tanya again, and after he left, she went downhill fast. The hospital called Clarence and told him that she wasn't going to make it much longer and that she took, oh, a, my God. Like she took a turn for the worse. And you need to come back here right away. And he's like, nah, I'm busy. Just donate her organs and cremate her as soon as possible. Thanks. And he did not come Man, back. Man, we need to we need to get on a Patreon and get these like video things going on because my eyes just bugged out of my head and nobody yeah. got to see, gets to see that. Yeah. So this is obviously not a normal reaction. So Tanya passed away later that day at 20 years old. So five days after the accident, she passed away at 20 years old. Oh, man, what a horrific life. Yeah. When her friends at the club found out that she had passed away, they were devastated. Because They were devastated because she had died, but they were also, like, confused because she seemed like she had been getting better. Right. And so then now they're convinced that he did something to her. I was going to say, did he, like, put something in her, like, in her feeding tube or something, in her IVs? They've never been able to prove that. There was no signs that he did anything. Wow. But that's what everybody thinks because they're, like, convinced that he had to have killed her. Yeah. So after she passes away, they're all devastated. When her friends at the club find out that Clarence was, like, in no way, shape, or form going to do any kind of funeral or service or anything, the owner of the strip club decided to pay for the funeral service. (sighs) Uh, Well, good. I'm glad that somebody had the decency to, you know, give her the proper goodbye that she more than deserved. I mean, she shouldn't have been dead at this age. Right. You know, whether for any circumstance, she shouldn't have been dead at this age or had such a rough life to this. Right. She shouldn't have been in any of these situations. Her dad forced her hand there. So, yeah. It also didn't come like easily. The strip club co- owner had to like call Clarence and be like, hey, we're going to do a funeral. We'll pay for it and everything. And he almost like fought them on it and was like, just leave it alone. And he's like, don't be a fucking asshole. I'm going to pay for everything. Like, just let us do this. He had to like talk him into letting them have a funeral for his wife. Like, give me a break. Well, and they don't even know that this is his daughter. Like, right. His wife. Yeah. But this is his daughter on, I guess, on top of it because <laughs> it is yeah. like. In every circumstance, this guy should be just an emotional wreck. Right. And he's just fine. Yep. Clarence, in the meantime, has Tanya's son, Michael, her two-year-old son. I had kind of forgotten about Michael. Yeah. Shortly after she passed away, Clarence takes Michael to the social services office and tells them that his wife had died and he needed some time to deal with that. So if they could just put Michael into foster care for like a week, he'll pick him up you know, in like a week or two. I don't think it works like that. Yeah, certainly not how that works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's not a daycare service. Yes. But they were like, oh, okay. And so they took Michael and they put him with a foster family that was like extremely experienced and like, you know, knew a lot about kids and foster kids and how to deal with them and all that stuff. And they immediately noticed there was issues. Michael was like over two He didn't speak. He had extreme behavior issues. He would slam his head against the table. He had obviously been severely neglected at like best case scenario, if not abused. So finally, some adults were involved in taking care of this. Yes. So while Michael's in foster care, Clarence shows up at Tanya's funeral. Hang on. What was the name of the author of this book? Matt Burke Beck. Oh. I knew it started with an M. I thought it was Michael. I thought we were getting firsthand knowledge. So, all right, never mind. Nope. <laughs> nope. Trying to connect some dots. No, no, no. So Clarence shows up to Tanya's funeral, put on for by her fellow employees and her boss, and was acting super erratic and even, like, angry and, like, threatening her friends and telling them that they're living in sin, the way they, what they do for a living, and, like, all kinds of weird shit. He was telling her friends from the club that, Tanya had a past and secrets and they don't even know her and just leave it alone. And he was like threatening them to just like forget this. I mean, her past and secrets were caused by him. Like, yeah, he's right. They don't know her. But because 
he's created this alternate life for her. Well, and the weird thing is they were like, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put our friend to rest and like have some closure over this, you fucking dick. Like, and now you're being a weirdo. I think I missed it. What happened to her mom again? She died in a car accident when she was young. Okay. Uh, Okay. Right, right, right. I knew that. But like her friends are like, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put her to rest and put closure to this fucking deal. Yeah. And you're not helping. Like, and now we have questions because you're being a weirdo. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, should have just left it alone and been sad like any normal person. Yeah, so they start thinking, why is there no family here? Like, she's 20 years old. Where's her aunts and uncles yeah. and her cousins? And Well, yeah, and when a young person dies, I mean, the, the turnout is always, eh, not always, but normally bigger. Right. So they're starting to think these co-workers of hers are, they're street smart. They're not idiots. You know, they're like. Right, they've been around the block. Yeah, they're like, this guy is a typical domestic abuser. Maybe he had isolated her from her family, and they might not even know she's dead. Spoiler alert, he is there. He is her family. But they don't know that. They think he's her husband. So the friends at the club and the club owner started, like, looking up all the Tadlocks, which was her maiden name, according to them. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I I was like, ooh, what's a Tadlock? I thought it was just a type of lock, but you're right, (laughs) that was what they changed her name to. Yeah, Tanya Tadlock. So they just started cold calling all the Tadlocks in the phone books to see if they had a daughter named Tanya born like sometime around 1970. Finally, they found a woman in Louisiana, I believe, that claimed to be Tanya's mother. What? Mm Mm-hmm. And- I just asked about her. She was dead in a car accident. Okay. But when they told her, hey, your daughter passed away, she was like, not surprised. She was like, yeah, she died as a toddler of a terminal illness like 18 years ago. Like, what are you talking about? Holy, holy crap. What? Yeah. Well, Tanya wasn't her real name. Well, I know, but did he? Yeah, but he found a Tanya Tadlock who died as a um, toddler and stole her identity. Yes. Whoa. So because Tanya wasn't her real name, that was the name that they had changed it to when they moved to New Orleans. So her friends at the club found the real Tanya Tadlock. But now they knew and the police knew that she had used a fake birth certificate to get that ID. And they knew that her real name was not Tanya Tadlock. So they're now they're really looking into this because they're like, well, wait a second. That's not even her name. What the hell? Yeah. What's going on here? In the meantime, Clarence calls social services to find out when a good time to pick Michael back up was. And he really was going to go back for him? Yeah. Oh, I, th- I thought that was just a, a thing to, to drop him off. Oh, no. No, no, no. He tried to pick him up. He just needed a week-long babysitter for free. Yes. And Idiot. So he's like, what's a good time to pick Michael up? And they were like, uh, quarter till never, you dick. Like, that's not <laughs> yeah. how it works. This kid is obviously has problems and been abused and you can't you don't just abandon your kid at social services. Not how this works. Like, no, totally. you're going to have to go to court and prove that you can take care of this kid. So at this point, Clarence is pissed because he's like, you can't just take my kid. And da, da, da. But <laughs> we didn't. You idiot. You, yeah. <laughs> you gave him to us. Exactly. So immediately after the funeral, Clarence tries to call his insurance company and cash in on an $80,000 life insurance policy that he had taken out on Tanya right before her death. Oh, man. No way. Mm -hmm. So when the agent was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry for your loss. Like, this is tragic. Your wife was only 20 years old. Like, oh, my goodness. You know, and he starts doing all the paperwork to file the claim. He said, I need your social. And so Clarence gives him a social security number and the guy comes back on. He's like, uh, maybe you transpose some numbers like that social isn't doesn't work. And so Clarence, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just grief stricken blah 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 he gives him a second social also not right Mm. so the agent comes on and he's like i'm sorry sir that didn't work either like what's going on here and he's oh my goodness i'm so sorry he gives him a third social security number and finally the agent comes back on and he's like oh third time's a charm we got it this is you know real social everything's good for his name well the agent was like everything's good your check will be in the mail and hung up and Immediately, he got on the phone and called the authorities and reported it because the third social that he had given him didn't match the name that was on his policy, but it did match the name of a wanted fugitive that was on the run for 18 years. Oh, no way. Mm -hmm. So this insurance agent like played it cool with Clarence and was like, your check's in the mail. But when he hung up, he was like, I got to call the cops. And it seems kind of weird. Like, oh, how does an insurance company have access to that kind of stuff? You know, but it's like insurance companies do not want to pay out money. Period. The end. (laughs) Yeah. 
That's their number one priority is to pay out as little money as humanly possible. So when you try to cash in on a life insurance claim, they check all the boxes to make sure that you're eligible to get that money because there's so many things that can make you not eligible. Anyway, that's how this agent found it. And so he called and reported it to the authorities like, hey, this guy's a wanted fugitive who's been on the run for 18 years. Like, you got to go get him. What name did it come back to? He accidentally gave them his social security number for his actual real name. That was what I was thinking. Which was Franklin Delano Floyd. What? Wait, there's a third one now and he's named after a president on top of it? Yeah, but this is his real name. Wow. He had been a wanted fugitive on the run since 1971. So, and at this point we're in 1990. Right. So, it's been like 18 and a half years. Oh, man. So Clarence realized right away what he had done. And he was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. Like, I just gave them my real social. What an idiot. So he did realize? Yeah, he realized after the insurance agent and him hung up, he's like, oh, my God. And so he booked it. He was out of there. Oh, wow. But I got to give a little bit of a warning right here because we're going to talk about his life of crime and how he ended up, you know, a wanted fugitive on the run. This is the lawless land. This is how he could get away with it. Yeah. Uh, well, and some of his crimes, though, are pretty graphic and super disturbing. So oh, I appreciate the warning then. Yeah. I want to warn you and the listeners because it's awful. That's why we have Christine do that warning in the beginning. I know. But the next part I'm going to say, I don't want to just word vomit it out. And then people go, oh, my God. Look, I want you to know something bad's coming. Well, I appreciate it. So if like you're at work or there's like people around, you should probably mute this real quick. Oh, no, I'm not at work. I'm free. Go ahead. (laughs) So (laughs) when they find out his real name and they start looking into what his deal is, his life of crime started very young. When he was like 16, it got super serious. He broke into a Sears department store in Inglewood, California. Yeah. So when the alarm went off at the Sears and the cops showed up, there was like a standoff and he ended up getting shot in the stomach during this incident. Holy, what did he steal? He was trying to steal a gun from the Sears. (laughs) Got it. Okay. Unfortunately, he survived this whole ordeal because a couple of years later in 1962, when he was just 19, he abducted a four-year-old girl from a bowling alley daycare near Atlanta. Wait, you you sounded like it was normal to have a bowling alley with a daycare. It is. I mean, I don't know now because I don't know if bowling alleys are still a thing, but there was a daycare at Regal Lanes where we grew up. I know because my parents were also on a Sunday night league and we used to have to go to the daycare while our parents bowled. Oh, oh, I guess I wasn't a part of that because I have no recollection. I remember a karaoke bar, but I have no recollection of a daycare. Oh, yeah. I even remember the lady who worked at the daycare at Regal Lanes. Her name was Flo. She was, like, super nice. Anyway, that's beside the point, Grant. We really can't get off track on this one because there's too much going on. All right. Sorry. So this little girl's parents were playing their Sunday night league when this little girl wandered out of the nursery and Frank took her. They ended up in a wooded area where he sexually assaulted her. And when the little girl was found, she it's been reported that she had trauma, semen, and bite marks on her vaginal area. Oh, God. Yeah. And she's four, by the way. Four years old. Oh, you weren't kidding. Yeah, you weren't kidding. I'm glad we did that warning in the beginning. Christine wasn't enough. Yeah. So he was convicted of child molestation for this, obviously. Thank goodness. And was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison, which is not nearly long enough, but that's beside the point. Nearly long enough. No. Yes. Later that year, he was actually sent to a state hospital to be evaluated for mental illness because they were like, oh, this guy's not all there. But while they were taking him to a doctor's appointment a couple of months after he ended up at this hospital, Frank escaped. Of course he did. Lawless yep. land. You can get out of anything and start a new life, apparently. Nope. No, no, no. They get him. Hold on. Oh, they got him. Yeah. So the next day after he escaped, he robbed a bank in Macon, Georgia. This bank robbery actually made like headline news because it was one of the first times ever that a security camera was used to capture a photo of a bank robber. Oh, that's cool. Like this was 1963. So this was like cutting edge technology. And the cameras haven't gotten any better since then. I know. We're still using the same ones (laughs) from then. Yeah, no doubt. So he was caught shortly after because of all this like hype about it and the security footage and all that stuff. So all of the $6,000 that he stole from this bank robbery minus like 15 bucks was actually recovered. His excuse for robbing the bank was that he needed money to appeal his child molestation conviction, which is 
not how that works. What was he even thinking with that? Like, I don't know. He's going to pay for a new trial? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So <laughs> they gave him another 15 years in prison and sent him back to a real prison instead of a mental hospital. Okay. So far, so good. Yeah. So then a few months later, in the fall of 1963, he tried to escape again. This time, he and two other inmates hotwired the prison's fire truck and used it to ram the gate at the prison and escape. Wow. It didn't really work because when they rammed the gate, they broke the truck. So then the truck didn't run. So then they just like took off running and they were caught like immediately. (laughs) <laughs> so it's okay. like well pretty stupid i will say it is kind of cool they hotwired a fire truck but yeah. that's the only thing he's done that's cool yeah that was 1963 so by 1971 he was released to a halfway house near atlanta so he served less than 10 years on a 10 to 20 year sentence for child molestation plus the 15 years for robbery he served less than 10 years total and he had two escape attempts in there and one actual escape wow So by 1971, he's released to this halfway house near Atlanta. Shortly after being released from the halfway house, just back into society, he abducted a woman and tried to sexually assault her, but she got away from him. He was arrested for this. So you would think since he was like a violent, dangerous guy who's escaped prison before and tried to escape twice and all this stuff that they would like hold him with no bond. But you would be wrong. He was released on bond pending trial for this abduction. He obviously skipped his court date in June of 1973 and was on the run ever since. So he's been just out and about since 1971 on the run and he just started over. Yep. Just started changing his name and living in ali- as aliases and all kinds of stuff. But now they were like, okay, we're sure we need to got- title this episode, the lawless land. Cause yeah. this is exactly what I think about when I think of the <laughs> lawless land. Yeah. But now the authorities are kind of sure that they had him. They're like, oh, he's in Oklahoma. Like this guy we've been looking for for 18 years. Right. Just popped up in Oklahoma under this alias trying to cash in on a life insurance policy for his wife. So when they go to swoop him up, he's gone. Like I said, he knew he fucked up when he told the insurance company his real social. So he split. Yeah. He was just, out of there. Yeah. Just left Michael in the foster care because he couldn't fight them because he couldn't stay to fight it because he knew he gave his real social. So a few months later, they actually track him down in Georgia. He ends up going to prison for a 33-month sentence. I'm not sure why it wasn't longer, being that he was on the run for like 17 years, but for some reason, he only went to prison for 33 months after being on the run for that long. That that is just mind-boggling to me that... They're like, eh, yeah. two and a half should be fine. I guess it's because he ended up serving out his sentence for jumping bail and skipping all that stuff. Obviously, they just didn't press charges for that other abduction because he only got 33 months. So there's no way that he wouldn't have gotten more time for abducting that woman at the gas station. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. So he only got a 33 month sentence. So they must have dropped the charges on the abduction and just charged him for the for the running, I guess. None of this makes a whole lot of sense. So I'm really excited for when you drop the hammer or whatever that is. It's going to make all of this come together. <laughs> OK. So while he's in prison for his 33 month sentence, Michael, little baby Michael, was thriving with his new foster parents. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, they were making huge, huge, huge strides and progress. And, you know, he when they got him, he wasn't speaking. He had all these behavior issues, all that stuff. And they worked with him and got him all the best doctors and shrinks and counselors, anything they could do. And they got, he was pretty much catching up to kids his age and he was doing really, really well. That's great to hear. Well, especially because he's really smart. We know how smart his mom was. So this makes all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the foster parents wanted to adopt him. They were like, we want him like he's ours. You know, we love him. He's part of our family, blah, blah, blah. Frank, which is Clarence and Warren, like same guy, Franklin. (laughs) Yeah, Right. Thank you. Frank fought this tooth and nail. He was Michael's father and they couldn't take him away from him. And he took him to court while he was in prison. He took them to court saying that he wouldn't give up his parental rights and all this kind of stuff because he didn't want them to adopt him. Like when he got out of prison, he wanted to be Michael's father still. So the courts were going on with this for months and months and months. And eventually the courts agreed that if he served his time and was going to change his life around and do the right thing, like he was Michael's father. So he had every right to try to get custody of him so they couldn't adopt him. 
So eventually the courts were granting him visitation with Michael in prison. So the foster family was forced to bring Michael to see this guy in prison. Ugh, and nobody's excited about this. I'm sure Michael's freaking out as soon as he sees him or is confused and doesn't remember him. Yep. And the foster family's going, this is so dumb. Yep. We hate all of this. And all that's happening is this selfish asshole in jail is going, great, I'm getting what I want. And the courts, because their general rule is always reunification, because for some right. reason they always think that's the best case scenario, and in a lot of cases it is not, but we'll give them a leeway. This is 1994. They didn't know as much then, I guess. They didn't but, have the internet quite yet. Yeah. So he's fighting this, and the foster family's fighting this, because when they take Michael to go visit him, when they come home, he regresses every time, you know, and they have to do a lot of work, and they're like, this is a nightmare. How, how often do they have to visit him? I don't know. It's not very clear, but I don't think it's, like, weekly. I think it's, like, every couple of months he has a visitation. Oh. But it it's a struggle for them because every time they have to re put them together. Yeah. So either the courts or the foster family finally request a paternity test because they're like, this sucks. And we don't even know if this guy is really his dad because he was living under fake names for all these years. You know, his wife was living under a fake name. They still don't know who she is. Yeah. Good. I didn't even think about doing a paternity test. That makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. He fought this paternity test, though, big time. He's like, I am his father. I've raised him. I've done, you know, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, eventually the courts are like, well, you can't fight it. If you want to see your son, you need to prove that he's your son. I have a question before we get into it, though. He is the grandfather, so I would assume the DNA would still show up to a degree. Is Am Correct. I totally wrong on that? Nope. Correct. Okay. So he takes the paternity test. It proved that he was not biologically related to Michael at all. Oh, really? Yes. So I understand him not being the father, but he was the father of the mother, so... Or was he? I'm just surprised... Oh, damn. Did he abduct another one? Oh, did I figure it out? He abducted this girl, too. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. All right. Are you Sorry. done? Sorry. Starting to put... The yeah, yeah, okay. but you, I think you might have dropped that hammer I was waiting on. Well, don't get too excited. You don't have it figured out. Oh, jeez. So Okay, keep going. Once this test proved that he was not biologically related to Michael, the visits were immediately stopped. The courts were like, nope, we're done with this. Like, this is bullshit. Good. Well, good, except that Frank kept pushing and filing appeal after appeal after appeal. And he really was pushing. And he's like, I understand that he's not my son, but he is my son. I'm the only father he's ever had. Like, he's my kid. And somehow through the courts, they realize that that's true. Like, if he did raise him, he's his father. And if he can prove that he's a good person and has changed his life around, like, why shouldn't he have his kid back? You know, just because he's not biologically his dad doesn't make him not his dad. Which right. is an argument okay. I can understand totally, except sure. when we're talking about a convicted child molester. Then it's like, eh, maybe we don't give him a kid that isn't his. <laughs> yeah, fair. But either way, they reverse this ruling and then they force the foster parents to start visitation again, which was horrible. After ending How long it, of a break was it, though? Like, how long before the breaks of visiting stopped versus him going back? Just a few months. Oh, okay. Not long enough to have the adoption go through no. and get finalized and stuff nope. yeah okay plus it couldn't because he filed appeals right away so while it was being appealed there was nothing that could happen but legally he doesn't have any parental rights i i don't think so i don't know i mean i get what there's on this reversal of the his parental rights being terminated he filed an appeal on that saying i am his father even though i'm not biologically his father and it was reversed so he does have parental oh. rights again Gotcha. So okay. when Frank is released, so the visits start again, and then Frank is released from prison on his 33 month sentence. Did he get out earlier? Did he so serve no, all 33 months? He served months? all 33 months. He was doing actually very well. He got a full time job as a, a maintenance man at an apartment complex, and he also got to live at the apartment complex for being the full time maintenance man. He was really trying to do everything to gain custody of Michael back. He was doing visits. He was working. He was had a place to live. You know, all this stuff. He was trying to prove that he could. Why does he have so much, such a vested interest in Michael? Like, is it so he can abuse him? Um, it's just the easiest kid to abuse, I, I guess. Or what's the deal? Why, like, why is he so adamant about it? I, I really don't know the answer. I don't even know that he knows the answer. I really mm, think okay. that it's just control. Like, he had always yeah, controlled Sharon, Tanya. Michael was just another thing that was his and not other people's. Gotcha. Okay. 
shortly after his release, though, and he's doing well and all this stuff, he is caught in a girl's apartment at the complex where he's a maintenance man. So he has keys to everybody's apartment. Right. So this guy should not have keys to everybody's apartment. Correct. She comes home and she walks into her bedroom to Frank Clarence Warren smelling her underwear. Oh, my God. He didn't hear her come in? Apparently not. And so she was like, oh, Uh, this is bad. And when he turned around and saw her, he had a knife in his hand and he attacked her. Holy hell. Mm -hmm. Why did he have a knife? I don't know. There was nobody in the apartment. Was it just in case? I guess. So her boyfriend walks in on this because he had come home with her. And so when he hears the ruckus, he walks in and he held Frank until the authorities got there. Hell yeah. Yeah. So this dick is caught literally red handed. Awesome. There's no chance that he didn't do this, you know. Right. So when the courts find out about this, there is no way that they could ignore this. He lost his apartment, his job, and he violently attacked a woman. On top of already not being Michael's father and being a convicted child molester, they were done. They were like, we're shutting this fucking shit yeah, down. he's back in school, or he's back in jail, right? Like, he goes back immediately? Yeah. He, he has to. Yeah, he gets arrested. So they're immediately, they're like, we're shutting this charade down. You're done. Your rights are terminated. This foster family can adopt Michael. We're done with this. Totally yeah, this done. Is a, <laughs> clearly a violation of parole. Yes. You would think that after all the escapes and violent offenses and running and aliases and all this stuff that once again, they wouldn't give him bail on this new charge for attacking the woman during that burglary. Yeah. Because at this point, they had looked into Frank's past enough to learn about a lot of his and Tanya's aliases because they've been trying to figure out who she is. So they knew at least about Sharon and Warren. You know, Sharon Marshall and Warren Marshall by now. So the prosecution fought hard to get him remanded with no bond. But nope, they let him out on bond awaiting trial for this. They just let him out? Yep, on bail. (laughs) Yep. While he's awaiting trial. Why is he slipping? They're going to try him. But while he's awaiting trial, they let him out on bail. Mm -hmm. But why is he slipping through the cracks so easily? I mean, this is the exact same reason why Samuel Little was so menacing. It was because he kept getting in trouble and then either mild sentences or just sentences that were just kind of like, meh. Oh, it's weird. Whatever. Do you think our legal system is broken? (laughs) You think our criminal justice system needs reform? There might be something to be said about that. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. So at this point, his obsession with Michael for the last three years that he was in prison was shattered. I mean, he has absolutely no right to Michael and he knew he was going back to prison and he had no legal standing. He was just fucked. You know, he had nothing. He was desperate and free. So in September of 1994, he walked into the offices at Indian Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw, Oklahoma at 9 a.m. And he was wearing a suit and asked to speak with the principal, whose name was James Davis. So the secretary told him, hang on, you know, sit here, wait for a minute. And when the principal called him in, Frank, Warren, Clarence, this guy, he pulled a gun out and told the principal, we're going to go get Michael and you're not going to say a word to anybody. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. So they got up and walked to Michael's classroom and he held a gun Mm. on the principal. Oh my God. Had the principal, you know, pop his head into the class and say, hey, I need to speak with Michael. And so the teacher sent Michael out to talk to the principal. And once they were in the hallway, he forced them to the parking lot and got into the principal's truck and left with Michael and the principal. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. How does this keep happening? Mm -hmm. How does it keep getting worse? I thought we had this figured out. Yeah, We're not even close. What? Nope. (laughs) So he drives to a wooded area. He walked the principal kind of deeper into the woods, told him to sit down next to this tree and handcuffed him to a tree. And the principal was like certain he was going to kill him. Like he's like, oh, he's going to shoot me, obviously. But he just left with Michael in the principal's truck and left the principal there handcuffed to a tree in the woods with duct tape on his mouth. Oh, my. Wow. Yeah, so pretty scary situation that the principal's in, even though he's alive. What are the chances here? Like, I'm handcuffed to a tree in the middle of the woods. Nobody even knows I'm abducted. So it's not like they're out looking for him. It was pretty sketchy there for a few hours. But he managed to get the duct tape off of his mouth somehow and just screamed for help in the woods for hours until somebody found him. Thank God somebody found him. I mean, yeah. 
just screaming like that, who knows what would have come up on him or... <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> well, since we host a true crime podcast, who yeah. <laughs> would have come up on him? So once the principal is found, he automatically immediately just starts telling them everything that happened. And they're like, oh my God, Michael's gone. And so there is a massive manhunt for Frank and Michael. You know, they searched everywhere and they were like, well, at least... Frank considers himself Michael's father, so maybe he's alive because he was obsessed with getting him back. So they think, well, maybe he's just got another alias and he's going to go underground and raise Michael and, you know, we'll have time to find him. That's what it sounds like to me, yeah. Yeah. When they start tracking down Frank's aliases, going to those towns and people who knew them, like, under those names, they come across a guy in Oklahoma and he had known Frank, Clarence Warren, whatever, from church, they asked him, like, do you have any pictures of when you knew Frank? And the guy was like, I don't know. He's like, wait a second. I have an old church directory from back then. So this guy pulls out a church directory from like the early 70s and shows them a photo of Frank. And in the photo, there's this little blonde headed five year old girl with him, like his daughter. And the guy was like, yeah, that's his daughter, Susie. And they're like, what? Susie? Yeah. And so it was shocking That the little girl in the picture, who was like probably five, looked so much like Tanya or Sharon. They were convinced it was her as a child. And she looked so much like Michael, like at the age he was right now, that they were like, this has got to be Tanya, Michael's mom, when she was a baby. Yeah, got to be. So so they're starting to realize this is real weird real quick. Well, they're starting to realize like, oh, shit, maybe she really was his daughter. You know, because they had kind of written that off of her being his daughter because... Of the no relation. But then again, they were like, maybe it is his daughter. I mean, she's five in this photo. And then they started putting the pieces together and they're like, wait a second. This is the early 70s and she's five in this photo. He would have been in prison when she was born. So this isn't his kid. Yeah. They don't know what the hell was going on, but they knew that she wasn't really his kid. But she. So no wonder he's going back for Michael. This is just his thing. Yeah. So they need to figure out who she was. Because they're like, he's she's not his kid, but he raised her. So it's like, where did she come from? But they had to find Michael first because Michael was still alive and Tanya wasn't. So like the time crunch was really on finding Michael. Yeah. So six weeks after the abduction, the principal's truck, the truck he stole Michael in. Right. Uh-huh. It was found in Dallas, Texas. Oh, wow. You know, he... he abducted him from Oklahoma and the truck was found in Dallas, yeah. Texas. That's a pretty good jaunt too cuz isn't Dallas like middle of Texas? Yeah, I'm not, right. I don't know. I don't know Texas geography that well. I'm going to look it up. But the insurance company had already paid out the principal for the for the truck. So when the truck is found, the insurance company now owns it and they get to sell it at an auction to try to get some money back from what they had already paid out. Right. So once the truck is found in Dallas, the insurance company sells it at an auction to a guy who bought it, just like a mechanic. Perfect. Okay. So then, but there's no sign of Frank or Michael in the truck or around the truck or anything. So they're just like, what, you know, whatever, they sell the truck to this mechanic. So then in November, like a month after the truck was found, the FBI had notified all the DMVs of Frank's like known aliases because they knew a lot of his aliases. They knew Warren Marshall. They knew the one, the church guy in the 70s. You know, they knew a couple of his aliases. So they, in, right. they notify all the DMVs around the country of all of his known aliases. But Frank doesn't know that they know his aliases. So he tried to renew his Florida driver's license under the Warren Marshall name. Right. But not in Florida. He wanted them to mail it to an address in Kentucky. So the FBI was got notified by the Florida DMV. They were like, hey, this guy wanted you told us to let you know about his name. So the FBI dressed up like the FedEx people to personally deliver his new (laughs) id (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. so they show up at his place in louisville kentucky and arrest him obviously once they have him in custody this is like november of 1994 they were like okay we're gonna find michael pretty quick you know they search his house they talk to him you know they're like where's michael there's no sign of mike and there's no sign that he's ever even been there so they start tracing his steps backwards from kentucky to atlanta back to dallas where he dropped the truck Mm -hmm. and he even had like a short stay in a mental hospital in there but there was no sign of michael anywhere on this like two-month journey from oklahoma to kentucky just nothing no trace of michael shit that's not good Mm mm-hmm Frank was talking, but he was not being cooperative at all. He would just give stories on top of stories of what happened to Michael. They were all different. 
Some ended with them him being alive. Some ended with them being him being killed. He tried to say that he never kidnapped him in the first place, that it was the mafia. Oh, well, that's a new one. Mm-hmm. And that Michael was safe in a foreign country and he just had to get to him and blah, 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 blah. Oh, this guy's nuts. Mm-hmm. So they end up charging him with kidnapping Michael, but they couldn't charge him with murder because they couldn't prove that he had killed him. Oh, yeah. Because they don't know, because he told so many different stories. But he was responsible for him, so, I mean, there at least has to be something that they can, you know, charge him for. They don't know where he is. Right, so that's what they charged him with, kidnapping, just not murder. All right. So he's convicted of the kidnapping, and he's sentenced to 55 years in prison. Finally, what? Yeah. (laughs) Like... Finally, something yeah. stuck with him. Well, totally. And he's like in his mid 50s at this point. So it, that's a pretty much a life sentence. Like he's not getting out. Right. Well, thankfully, I mean, this guy needed to be in jail for life years ago. Right. So we don't know what happened to Michael. We still don't know what happened to Michael? No. Oh, my God. God, so, I mean, for all we know, he was sold off into a foreign land and is fine somewhere else. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. So, in the meantime, during his trial for Michael's kidnapping, the mechanic that bought the principal's truck at that auction... Oh, yeah. ...had taken the truck back to his shop, and he was, like, doing a once-over on it, and he put the truck up on the lift, like, the mechanic's lift, and he found a manila envelope taped to the gas tank between like the bed of the truck and the cab of the truck okay so of course he's like well maybe this is yeah treasure you know so of course he's like somebody put this here on purpose you know yeah bingo yeah so he opens it up the contents of the envelope were disturbing to say the. i mean he freaked out was it pictures it was pictures <sighs> there was almost a hundred photos of Tanya, Sharon, whatever her name is, over the years being sexually assaulted, abused, you know, as a child all the way through her teenage years, along with other children. There was also a bunch of an adult woman who was bound and obviously in the pictures being tortured and beaten. And in in some of the photos, they thought she was already dead. Like it was that bad. Oh, my God. I hate that. Right. Like, it's worse enough to be doing it, but why are you photographing it? Like, and I mean, I know why they're photographing it, but like, yeah, stop. Yeah. (laughs) Like, just stop being weird. Yeah. Immediately, obviously, he calls authorities and is like, I can't have these. Yeah. This isn't mine. Yeah. (laughs) Trust me. These aren't mine. Here you go. So they, they run the VIN number on the truck. They check what the story was with it and who it's connected to. And they start putting the pieces together that the little girl in the photos is Sharon, Tanya. Right. They were like, oh my gosh, like he's been abusing her forever. Yep. And they still don't know if she's his daughter or not. I was gonna just going to ask that. Like, is this his daughter? Do we know? But it sounds like we don't. Yeah, we don't really know. But they're pretty sure she's not because he would have been in prison when she was conceived. So it's like, uh, but he's had her since uh. she was so tiny that they're like, maybe it is. Like, I don't know. So they focus at first on the adult woman in the photos who was bound and tortured and because they were pretty certain this woman was dead. Like she right. did not look alive. The first thing they noticed was she had super hardcore tan lines and she was wearing a bikini top in some of the photos. Can I guess something? Hmm. Is it Sharon as an adult and then he hit her with a car and then dumped her? No. Oh, okay. Good try though. You'll you'll catch on here in a second. Okay. All right. So the FBI put on their thinking caps like you tried to just do. (laughs) They looked at all these pictures of this woman and judging by like her tan lines and the bikini top and some of the other things they saw in the photo, they started looking at all the places that he had lived over the years under different aliases. And they decided based on these photos, they were going to start in Florida. I would. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So they sent these pictures to the Florida authorities and said, do you recognize this woman as like a missing person or a homicide victim? And they went through their records. And they found a Jane Doe. Your favorite. Mm hmm. Whose skeleton had been found in like a marshy, brushy area off of a freeway off ramp in mm. Pinellas County, Florida, just like a year before. So we're in like 94, 95 now. Yeah. This skeleton was found just like a year before, but it had roots and weeds growing all through it. So they knew it had been there for a while. That's uh, roots and weeds growing through it. I mean, man. Yeah. But the kicker was what they found with the skeleton. They found the same bikini top that was in the photos. Oh, wow. And jewelry that matched some of the items 
that the woman in the photos was wearing. Ooh. And the injuries to the skull of the skeleton matched the injuries to the head of the woman in the photos. So they pretty quickly, like, it was clear this was their Jane Doe. Yeah, they put it together. But do we have a name? No. So they find their victim, okay. but she's a Jane Doe. Right. And so they're like, well, damn it. So they start thinking, well, Warren Marshall lived in this area where this girl was found and where these pictures were taken from 88 to 89. Like, it was a very short period of time. So they start doing searches of missing women from the area around that time. They found the missing persons file for Cheryl Camesso. Oh, so now we have a name. Yeah. She was the exotic dancer that had the Corvette that went missing when Sharon and Warren were living in Florida. Oh, my God. So they find this missing person for Cheryl Camesso, and they're like, Yahtzee, everything matches. She went missing at the right time. She had this connection to Frank and Sharon. She went missing in 89. Like, this is our Jane Doe. Right. Yeah. Everyone thought she had started a new life, but she hadn't. She had just been killed. Yeah. There was other things in the photos that linked him to the pictures, besides just the fact that they were in that truck. Mm -hmm. Friends from the time that they lived there identified things in the background that belonged to Frank. Like the couch that was in some of the pictures was his couch, stuff like that. Oh my gosh. They were like, this is obviously taken in his trailer. Right. And his thumb was visible in some of the photos. The way he took the photo, his thumb was in some of the photos. And- it was like an exact map. Like, it was obviously his thumb. Do you have a wonky thumb? to be like, oh, yeah, you got a little stubby thumb just like in the photo. Or... No, but like if I took a picture of my thumb and then you were looking at another picture of my thumb, you'd be like, yeah, that's the same thumb. That's true. Yeah. So it was like pretty obvious that Warren had killed Cheryl after she had reported them for the welfare fraud and all that stuff. And they were fighting back and forth. He obviously killed her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in 1997, Frank was extradited to Florida from prison where he was serving time for kidnapping Michael. He was extradited to Florida to stand trial for Cheryl's murder. But before he could stand trial, he was deemed mentally incompetent. Uh, Which for him is a good thing. Yeah, right. Well, because he couldn't be found guilty and sentenced to death. Florida has a death penalty. But this dipshit fought tooth and nail to prove that he was competent. Why? Because he was offended that they thought he was mentally incapable of standing trial. He was like, don't... (laughs) Don't test so my he's mental so, stability. He's so mentally incompetent that he wants to prove that he's mentally competent so that he can get a harsher sentence? I guess. Was he going for the death penalty? Like, no. Was he trying for it? Oh, no. He was convinced oh. that he was framed and he was going to get off on this and all that. Stuff. So it was ridiculous. But it was like. Oh, I think he's getting off on this. Yeah, but it's like. It's dude, not the same way. To just let it go. Like, they said you're crazy, just leave it alone, you know? So, eventually, after fighting tooth and nail for years, they were like, fine, dude, fucking go to trial then. And they reversed the incompetent ruling and let him go to trial. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, if you really want. Yeah. So, in 2002, he goes to trial for Cheryl's murder, and he refused to use the insanity defense, which would have been his best option, because he obviously had a history of being mentally incompetent and long stays in mental hospitals and all that stuff, but he was certain he didn't want to go that route. So, he went with the, like, I was framed defense, which Idiot. did not work at all. No, he has nothing to prove that he was no. framed. No, no, no. Because he wasn't. <laughs> no, he tried to say the FBI put his thumb in those photos and... <laughs> <laughs> they doctored the pictures of Sharon from when she was a kid. You know, it was like total bullshit. So anyway, yeah. he's convicted and sentenced to death because that's what you do. Right. So this is 2002. He's conv- convicted, sentenced to death. And in 2007, during an appeal, he was deemed incompetent again. <laughs> and was he offended again? Yeah. But (laughs) what is he going to do, you know? So they can't carry out his sentence because you can't put a mentally incompetent person to death. So he just sits (laughs) in prison. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I'm fine with that. (laughs) But it's just like... He's, like, trying so hard to prove that he's not crazy. It's like, if you prove that you're not crazy, dude, they're going to kill you. (laughs) Like... Yeah. He's just so stupid. And probably a mentally competent person would be like, okay. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's the thing, is it obviously proves that he's not all together with it. Or he's so all together with it that he knows that that's going to make him look not all together. You never know with this guy. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. But he's in his late 70s, so he's going to die in prison before they execute him, like just of regular death. Is he in Gen Pop? Do we know? Because he's not on death row. He is on death oh, row. Oh, he is? Yes, because he has a death sentence. Oh. He's just, just 
not capable of being executed. <laughs> he's, he doesn't qualify. Gotcha. You can't put a person who's unwell to death as like a rule. But and it's fair. You yeah. Know, I take, no, no, no. I know fine. why. I'm just saying like that's the rule. But so he's still on death row because that is his sentence. But he's not going to be put to death. Wow. But he'll he's in his late seventies, so he's probably gonna die in prison. Yeah. So Wow. Pretty crazy, huh? That is a bananas case with lots of twists and turns. You weren't kidding. Like you told me to buckle up and I absolutely had to. <laughs> this might have to be a two part episode just because there was a lot in there and a lot to unpack. You're like super acting like we're wrapping it up here, but this is not over. <laughs> It's not over yet? No. No. The FBI still hasn't identified Tanya, Sharon, my, little baby Michael's mom, or found oh out what's God. gone on with baby Michael, even. All right. So let's keep going on this story so that we can get you to the boom wow factor. Okay. So finally in 2014, the FBI agents that are interviewing Frank all the time, trying to find out what the hell he did with Michael, and they're still trying to figure out who Tanya is, but they're mostly focused on finding Michael. And during one of these interviews, he let slip Tanya's birth name. Oh. Like they were interviewing about about Michael, but he was like, you know, Tanya was born in Michigan in 1969. Her name's Suzanne Savakis. What? So they were like, Ooh, write that down. And yeah. they tracked down her birth certificate and contacted her birth father listed on the birth certificate as uh, Cliff Savakis. So they asked him if he knows Tanya or Sharon, and he didn't. But he did know that he did have a child in the late 60s with a woman named Sandy while he was in Viet like in Vietnam, like during the war uh -huh. stuff. <laughs> right. When he returned, he tried to see his daughter. But Sandy had remarried another man and had more kids and moved to Virginia, and they just kind of like lost track. So the last time he saw her, she was two years old. This happens more than you think, like around that time. I've seen like a hundred episodes of Unsolved Mysteries where they're like reunited with their birth fathers because of the Vietnam War thing. Oh, wow. It's kind of weird. I've seen it a lot. Yeah. And I, I feel like part of it had to do with like if she did get remarried and like moved to a different state, there was no internet back then, no FaceTime. Like it was just like, well... I guess I'll marry this other lady and have more kids and not worry about that one. <laughs> like, I, it's weird, but it's like, how was yeah. he going to find her? Yeah, I guess so. If they're not keeping in touch back then, I mean, yeah, they'd probably be very hard. Right. So they inform him, obviously, of this tragic story of what they think might be his daughter. And they get a DNA test and everything. And they track down this lady, Sandy, who he said he had the baby with, Sandy Shipman, who was on the birth certificate also. Right. They ask her the same shit. Do you know Tanya? Do you know Sharon? No, no. But when they showed her the picture of Frank with five-year-old Suzanne from that church directory photo that they had found, uh -huh. she immediately was like, that's my missing daughter, Susie, and my ex-husband, Brandon. Brandon? And they're like, what? So this is how her story goes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. In 1974, right after he went on the run, Frank went on the run, this Sandy lady met a man named Brandon Williams at a truck stop in North Carolina, who was obviously Frank. This was another alias. <laughs> yeah. Got it. <laughs> and, yeah. And she had three daughters at the time who were in state custody. Her oldest daughter, Suzanne, and then two other daughters from another man. And she was pregnant with a son. And she was single. So after like a two week whirlwind courtship with this Brandon character, they decided their best option was to get married at a truck stop in North Carolina. Yeah, it's normally how that goes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she doesn't know this guy. She knows him for two weeks and that's not even his real fucking name. So they end up somehow getting her daughters back out of state custody. And then she has her son, Philip the baby that she was pregnant with. And yep. shortly after all of this happens, they move to Dallas, Texas. When they're in Dallas, she ends up getting locked up for like fraud or forgery or something. She wrote bad checks or something. And she served like a month in jail. So her four kids were with Frank while she was in jail. So when she got out and went to their apartment, her husband, Brandon, Frank, and her kids were all gone. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. This guy is a bigger monster than we ever could have thought. Mm -hmm. So she ended up finding her two middle daughters pretty quickly at a local children's home, like an orphanage where he had abandoned them. But she was never able to find her oldest daughter or her one-year-old son, Philip. Mm. She says that she tried to find them and that she tried to report them missing, but the police told her that he had a right to take them because he was their stepdad and she was in jail, which is like an iffy story at best. But they're like, OK, yeah. 
like the investigators are listening to the story and they're like, oh, that doesn't seem legit, but we'll <laughs> brush, yeah. brush past that and just keep, sure, we'll move on. keep going on this. So they run the DNA testing from her biological father. They take DNA testing from this woman, Sandy, and they have a vial of Tanya's blood from the autopsy and they compare it in 2014 and they confirm that she was Suzanne Savakis. Oh, my God. And that God. her stepdad, who was Franklin Delano Floyd, Clarence Warren, right. Brandon, whatever the fuck, abducted oh. her when her mom was in prison. Wow. Mm -hmm. So shortly after he had kidnapped Susie and Philip, he popped up in Oklahoma and Susie was enrolled in school. They've been able to trace her life from there, you know, living as his daughter, Sharon through school and all that, and Tanya's wife before she died, which is like super tragic. Absolutely. But there's never been any record of her brother Philip or whatever happened to him, just like her son Michael, that they don't know what happened to him. In 2014, he had pretty much admitted that he had killed baby Michael the day he kidnapped him. Oh, like man. He, he even gave the FBI like a location, but they've never been able to find any trace of Michael, even after like extensive searches, because he says it was near the Texas-Oklahoma border, and apparently this area has a lot of like wild boars. Ugh. So they're assuming little, little six-year-old Michael was consumed pretty much whole and at this point it's been 20 years so there's not going to be much left but they've done searches trying to find anything you know bullet casings or metal from clothing or anything to try to like confirm this story but they're pretty sure that this is the real story that when he kidnapped michael the boy was like six and he'd been living with his foster parents for four years he hadn't really been around frank except for the forced visitation since he was two so he really didn't know him the assumption is that pissed frank off when he abducted him and mm. so he killed michael right away and then just kept running oh my god yeah like, this guy ruined two very promising lives oh i mean obviously more than that but like yeah initially connected to two little children's lives well, and that cheryl have been, and cheryl but you know, yeah cheryl was older so i was talking about like you know yeah kids how he, i know what you mean right yeah. babies you know and stuff so oh man so, so this is pretty much wrapped up now they had they know who Sharon Tanya was. Her name was Susie Savakis. They right. know how he abducted her, all of that stuff. They know that he raised her as his child and then forced her to be his wife and then probably killed her in that hit and run. They know that he abducted baby Michael, probably killed him too. But now they have another missing child, her baby brother, Philip. Is there anything on, on that? Yeah. So he's entered into Nekmek as a missing endangered baby. In 2020, a man came forward and said that he thought he was baby Philip. And the, re the reason he thought so is because he was adopted as an infant and decided in his 40s to Google his birth name, which his adoptive parents like freely gave him. And when he Googled it, he found out that he was on Nekmek as a missing endangered kid. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so his story is totally different than Sandy's, and he said- yeah, he, he survived. No, Sandy, the birth mother, who says that Franklin oh, abducted oh. her two kids. Gotcha. Sorry, there's a lot of S names going on. I know. He says that he was adopted as an infant, and his parents knew Sandy, his birth mother. His mother, his, oh. his adopted mother, and Sandy were pregnant at the same time, and that this mother lost her baby shortly after birth. So they were devastated, obviously, and then- Sandy came to them and offered for them to adopt Philip because her new husband didn't want him because he wasn't his baby. Her new husband would have been Franklin Delano Floyd. Right. Mm -hmm. This family has tons of photos and documents and everything to prove that they had him a year before Susie was even kidnapped. And they ran DNA tests and confirmed that this man is Philip. And he lived a happy, healthy life with two loving parents. So it's not really clear why Sandy lied about Philip also being kidnapped. But because obviously Susie was kidnapped, but she had already given Philip up, Philip up for adoption like long before they ever moved to Texas and long before he kidnapped Suzanne. So crazy. Anyway, I wanted to end on them finding Philip alive because. Yeah, I'm glad that they did, because, I mean, after all of that back and forth and, you know, the ups and downs and things like that, I mean, it's a it, it's nice that there's at least a, a happy point in this and that he. Philip avoided obviously this tumultuous life of turmoil. Yeah. And 
was able to, I assume, thrive and do very well. Oh, yeah. He he grew up in a very healthy home with loving parents. Like, he's totally great. And that's why I wanted to end on that, because it's like, it's the only thread of this story that isn't just completely tragic. Yeah. And we don't often get many happy endings yeah. to our stories. So it's yeah. nice to have one that is. Yeah. Every other thread in this story is horrible. So it's like, at least there's one that's kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel. Totally. Yeah. It is weird still. Like, there's still a lot of weirdness around it. Like, why she would say he was, a, like, you don't forget that. Like, you didn't forget you gave him up for adoption. Like, so I don't know. I've, probably guilt or something, I would guess. Because it's, I mean, her husband was like, yeah, I don't want this anymore. And like, get rid of him. Yeah. You know? Like, so. so I, I just thought that was a, a interesting ending i guess no this wasn't a, a completely bananas case you were right there was lots of twists and turns and I, I didn't have a terrible time keeping up there were some you know spots in it but yeah overall i mean this was a really interesting case and i'm surprised it's not m more well known probably because it's hard to tell so yeah. people don't want to get caught up in it but yeah it is hard wow. to tell. but the yeah, other you did a great job the other thing I did want to mention, too, is that a lot of, you know, documentaries and other podcasts and things about this story kind of kind of wonder about Tanya and if she knew about Cheryl's murder and, you know, why they were changing her name and all that stuff and why she would, you know, they almost make it seem like she might have been like an accomplice. But from what I got from the story, I don't I think she was totally a victim her entire life. Exactly. And I don't think she was an accomplice at all. I think she was afraid. Some people are like, well, I wonder why she never told anybody that she was kidnapped or never ran away. And she did run away quite a few times. And he always found her. Right. And the other thing I thought about through this whole thing was he adopted her so young. And the story was always that her mom died when she was young. I wonder if she didn't know. She didn't. That she wasn't Frank's. Like, I wonder if no. she really thought he was her father her whole life. She didn't know. I mean, when you're that young and like he's telling her a new truth and eventually her she's just going to be like, OK, you know, that's what it is. That's part of the the brainwashing or the, you know, yeah. the psychological abuse that went in all, all this. That's yeah. Along that's with all the physical stuff. and sexual abuse. Yeah. Like it's she had a horrible life. But that's the one thing that made me so sad to think about too was that I don't know that she knew he wasn't her dad. I mean it's possible he told her over the years, but it's also possible that he didn't and she really thought he was her dad. That's to me I'm like, Oh my god, that's the worst part. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't tell you a whole lot about Franklin's childhood either, because that's a whole nother tragic topic and is probably a pretty huge factor on why this guy ended up being mentally unstable and violent and a nightmare. But I didn't want to sound like I was sympathizing with him because he had a really bad childhood. Like what? Well, he was abandoned as a two-year-old in an orphanage because his dad had died and his mom couldn't take care of five kids. And, you know, the orphanage was abusive. And then he got kicked out. And at like 15, he found his birth mom, who was a sex worker, and she forged papers for him to get into the army. But then they caught on that he was only 16. So they kicked him out and that's when he began his life of crime and then he was like extremely Damn. sexually assaulted and beaten regularly Ugh. during his first prison sentence because he was a child molester yeah so there's a lot of like stuff in his background that probably attributes to a lot of what was wrong with him but i didn't want to sound like i was sympathizing with him or had any kind of like i don't know like it's not an excuse for what he did to all the rest of these people in his life no i I totally understand. Because tons of people go through that as a child and then don't go on to abuse other people. Right. Plus, we don't know how much of that's true because we hear that from him. It's not like the orphanage is coming forward going, oh, yeah, we used to totally beat kids up. Well, of course not. They're not going to come out and say right. that. <laughs> right. So it's like, I don't know. Who knows if it was as even as extreme as he says it was. Wow. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. I know. This is a super long episode. I really didn't think it was going to be this long. I don't know why I didn't think that. Yeah, that was super long, but that was a lot to chew on. I'm going to be thinking about this for the next several days. So <laughs> yep. Like you have been. Yep. All right. Well, we are on all of the social media. So come give us a follow on Instagram at from crime to crime. You can find us on TikTok. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, we're from crime, the number two crime, but we're out there. You can find us. And don't forget to change your Amazon smile donation to DNA Doe Project. And one day I will. All right. I love you. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.